Welcome everyone uh, to our session on implementing Dapper in an existing environment. Today we'll be taking you through how we use Dapper to improve an existing event-driven microservice landscape at AgroFirm. We'll discuss choices, the way Dapper has helped us, and give you some pointers on how Dapper may help you in your uh, yeah, landscape uh, to improve uh, yeah, to improve it. First of all, I want to give a quick introduction on our company. Uh, we are IT consultants at InfoSupport, uh, a leading provider in IT consulting and software development. Uh, we specialize in delivering custom solutions for customers, including software development, data management, cloud services, uh, and more. With a strong focus on innovation and collaboration, uh, we help organization, uh, organizations achieve their digital transformation goals and stay ahead in today's rapidly evolving technology landscape. And I want to give you an introduction on AgroFirm. AgroFirm is one of our customers. They are an agricultural cooperative spe uh, specializing in providing practical solutions and support for farmers. With a focus on precision agriculture and sustainability, AgroFirm offers services ranging from animal nutrition to crop solutions. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we took over uh, a project at AgroFirm where the main goal was to realize the implementation of e-commerce applications and the self-service portal to replace all the systems. Uh, the entire platform exists of multiple customer-facing applications and about 100 microservices. Uh, and to accomplish this, we decided to utilize Dapper. In today's session, we will give you an insight into the work we have done, the choices we've made, and show you how Dapper has helped us implement an event-driven microservice architecture. Now I want to give you uh, a quick introduction about us. Uh, joining me today is Mika Koosbeek and my name is Stijn Rutte. Uh, we both started at InfoSupport about three and a half years ago uh, and started at AgroFirm uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, during that year and a half, we have had about one year of experience with Dapper. Right, um, what are we going to talk about today? Well, firstly, we are going to uh, tell you why we chose Dapper, uh, what led up to us choosing Dapper uh, and uh, yeah, what were the benefits that drew us towards Dapper. Uh, next, we're going to talk about how we implemented Dapper. So we're going to give you some uh, information about how we use the Dapper Helm chart in our Kubernetes cluster, uh, which uh, input and output bindings we use uh, with yeah, multiple uh, messaging solutions. Uh, we'll show you how we implemented the state store using Redis, uh, and we'll also show you how we uh, manage our secrets and uh, using managed identities and uh, the uh, secret component. And lastly, we'll give you some takeaways uh, on what we've learned and uh, what might help you. Firstly, I want to give you some information on why we chose Dapper. Uh, when we joined our project about a year and a half ago, uh, development had already been underway for a couple of years. And during the implementation, a previous team decided uh, on using Akka.net. Uh, which is an implementation of the Active Framework for .NET. Uh, well, Aka.NET is a powerful tool that certainly has its use cases. Uh, a lack of governance and a lot of over-engineering caused the landscape to become overly complex, prone to errors, and hard to navigate and govern. Um, so early on, we decided to overhaul a lot of these services, eventually hoping to replace them, um, and yeah, most of the existing landscape for new components. To accomplish this, we would need to rebuild a lot of existing integrations, which were heavily dependent on Akka.net, uh, as well as Akka.net specific integrations and logic or interfaces. Um, aside from that, we wanted to keep our options open and have the possibility to replace existing message brokers or integrations with other alternatives. Uh, so Dapper would give us the possibility to focus on implementing the actual business logic uh, of our application without having to focus on implementing any best practices for the existing components in our landscape. To give you an idea of what our uh, landscape used to look like, in this example, you can see uh, the services used and required to replace or to place an order in the shop. Uh, during this process, a total of 12 services were, were required using multiple events. We use a total of three API calls that we send through API management to, uh, to stop. Um, <clears throat> And apart from that, we expose a webhook uh, to SAP to get updates on any changes uh, on products. Uh, during the process, we also use external integrations like SendGrid to send emails to users. 
and uh, Signal R to update clients asynchronously uh, about updates uh, to orders. Uh, this process was uh, too complex for what we needed to accomplish, and we decided to replace a big part of these services, combining them into fewer, bigger services, uh, which were using more logical uh, separations. And at the same time, uh, we wanted to step away from Arca.net. Uh, we mainly used Dapper uh, for service-to-service -service communication and caching via Redis, uh, but we might want to um, yeah, uh, utilize more of Dapper in the future. All right. Next, I would like to talk to, to you about how we uh, deploy Dapper on our Azure Kubernetes environment. Um, at Archivum, we use AKS uh, to run and deploy our sites and services. Um, of course, to run Dapper on this environment, we also need to install all of the basic building blocks for Dapper. Um, to do this, we decided to use the Dapper Helm chart. Um, this is a Helm chart officially provided by Dapper. Uh, which, as you can see here, can be found in uh, the GitHub repository. Um, this Helm, Helm chart provides you with the uh, standard components, like the security components, the placement service, the sidecar injector, and the Dapper sentry. Um, so we decided to use this with the Helm chart um, because of our existing workflow for CI CD. Um, we use Argo CD which is a open source tool for uh, GitOps deployments um, to deploy all of our sites and services with uh, Helm charts already. So the Dapper Helm charts, uh, Helm charts fit pretty well with our uh, way of working. Um, getting the Dapper Helm chart to work with Argo CD uh, was quite easy, um, only to minor changes were necessary uh, to get it to run properly. Uh, it turned out that Argo CD was quite aggressive in uh, killing the uh, Dapper application if it didn't start up within uh, a certain amount of time. Uh, so as you can see here at the top, um, we had to increase the timeouts for the liveliness probe and the readiness probe um, of Dapper so that it wouldn't be killed before it even had a chance to start. Um, and secondly, um, our Argo CD instance uh, didn't allow for applications to run in uh, root mode, which the DAPA placement service uh, did by default. Um, so we also, also had to uh, turn this off with the setting here at the bottom. Um, so this is the way that we deploy DAPR to our Kubernetes environment. Um, if, however, you are also using AKS uh, and want to run DAPR, I would also highly recommend using uh, uh, looking into the uh, Dapper AKS extension, which is an extension for uh, AKS also provided by Dapper, which allows you to achieve the same purpose as the Helm chart. Um, it's a different option. We at IFM chose for the Helm chart uh, because, as I said, it fit in with our way of uh, deployment, uh, but also due to technical limitations. Um, so this is definitely a very viable option. Next up, I want to talk to you guys about uh, the state store component. We use this to implement Redis into our application landscape. Um, yeah, we wanted to use Redis as a caching method, uh, especially uh, in the services uh, handling our shopping carts. Uh, we often have to retrieve those. They're quite big. Um, we want to add stuff to them, uh, update them, show them to users, and uh, yeah, getting them from a relational database took quite a bit of time. So we decided to implement uh, Redis uh, as a cache uh, to uh, yeah, speed that up. Um, and we use Dapper to, uh, to enable that. So what is the state store component? For those who don't know, uh, the state store component allows you to do well, CRUD operations on a host of different um, state, uh, state management tools. So think about Cosmos DB, uh, Azure Blob Storage, uh, MongoDB. Uh, and in our case, we used Redis. Um, it also allows you to use transactions on those operations. Um, so that's quite nice. Um, in our case, we uh, used it. Um, and one of the benefits is that we didn't have to learn any fancy Redis SDKs uh, or best practices. We could just use the Dapper client um, that enabled us to uh, yeah, do everything that we needed. We only needed the CRUD operations. Um, so that uh, yeah, helped us out. Uh, if you do need to do a more complex uh, operations, the uh, states or component might not have you covered, so take a look at the documentation for that. Well, how did we implement it? Uh, first of all, we created a new uh, component. 
uh, using YAML. Um, it's quite easy. We specify the type of uh, well, type Redis. Then we gave the host of our Redis instance, which is running on Azure. Um, so we just yeah, use the default uh, URL uh, together with uh, the name of our service. Uh, and then we have a password, uh, which is a secret key reference. Um, and we can retrieve that from Azure Key Vault. I'll show you a little bit later uh, in this demonstration how we uh, set that up. Um, but it makes it quite easy that we don't have to handle any uh, secrets or uh, references to secrets, um, but we can just yeah, rely on Deborah to do that for us. Uh, next up, we implemented uh, the actual implementation of the Redis cache. Um, we implemented uh, a repository pattern as known in DDD um, to do this. Uh, and basically what we did is, okay, we're gonna check in the Dapper cache or in a Dapper client um, states or component uh, if we can retrieve a certain value. If that value is not available, uh, we just return null. Uh, and if it is available, we deserialize that to, uh, to the object that we need. Uh, and then later on, we could, uh, basically use it in our repository pattern. Uh, in the repository pattern, we specify if we want to use the cache. By default, we do want to use the cache. Um, and if we do want to use the cache, then we call that method that you saw earlier to retrieve a value. Uh, if we see that the value is uh, not null, then we can immediately return that value from our cache. Uh, if it is null, then, well, we need to do something else. Um, we can just uh, retrieve them from our normal DB context. Uh, and when we retrieve it, we also want to make sure that we save it to our cache. So uh, let's say that I'm in this, yeah, in our front end uh, and I close it and I want to open it again. I don't have to uh, retrieve it from the database again, but uh, from there on, it will be in my cache. So it makes it quite easy to, uh, to implement this uh, without having to use uh, any uh, specific SDKs. Uh, you can just rely on Dapper. All right, that was the state store component. Right now, I'd like to, like to talk to you about uh, the Dapper bindings that we use. Um, in this simple diagram, uh, I uh, will show you uh, the current setup at the Agriform we use for sending and receiving events. Um, as you can see here on the left, we have service A, which sends an event to EventGrid. Um, EventGrid will then um, forward this event to all of the Azure service bus queues that are subscribed to that event. Uh, and via the service bus queue, uh, the events will end up at, uh, well, in this case, service B and service C. Um, so those are the two Azure resources we use. Um, for that, uh, we use two Dapper bindings. Um, one is the input binding for Azure uh, service bus, and one is the output binding for uh, Azure event grid. Um, so let's first have a look at the input binding. Um, well, it's quite a simple component. As you can see, we use the type uh, azure.servicebus queues um, to connect to the service bus, for which we provide the name of the service bus uh, and the namespace of that service bus. Um, as you can see in this component, uh, we use no uh, credentials to connect to it or no connection strings. Um, that is because we use uh, Azure Managed Identities to connect to um, to Service Bus. Um, well, as you might imagine, that's uh, uh, really useful because you don't have to uh, worry about any credentials being in your code or uh, anywhere else. It's all handled by uh, by Azure and Dapper. Um, so this is a, a simple code example uh, of how we actually receive the events. The uh, um, input binding will forward any events that it receives to this HTTP endpoint. Um, those two are matched uh, based on the name. So in this case, that's just a Q. Um, and here we will receive the event uh, as the uh, HTTP post body. Uh, and from there on, we can handle it as we see fit. Um, next, let's have a quick look at the output binding. Um, so as said before, this will connect to Azure Event Grid. Um, in this case, uh, Event Grid did not support managed identities. So in this case, we actually had to use uh, the access key for Event Grid um, and the endpoint. Um, we did however use, as in the state store component, uh, the secret sort to get this event, uh, event Grid key. Uh, so we don't store it in the code. 
then let's also have a quick look at how we then send events. Um, we can just use it by using the Debra client and then the generic invoke binding action. Um, for this, we pass the uh, action create. Um, this tells the component that it has to send an event to event grid. Um, and then as a parameter, we can pass it a list of uh, events. Um, the uh, main advantage in this case for sending and receiving events with Tepper um, is that we are uh, basically free to uh, choose our sending and receiving technologies uh, at any point in time. So uh, currently, as shown in the diagram here, um, we use EventGrid and Service Bus, but because we use these bindings, we can easily change those technologies uh, on the fly. So for example, if at any point in time we decide to use uh, RabbitMQ, for example, um, we can switch it with almost no changes to the code. The only small change in this case uh, we would have to make um, is in this little piece of code because it uh, EventGrid actually wants events in a certain format, the EventGrid format. So uh, that's also something we provided here. So for another technology for event sending, we'd have to change that up a little bit. But for the most part, the code will stay the same. So switching in the future, as we expect to happen at the Agile firm, uh, yeah, that will be really easy for us. Last thing I want to talk to you about uh, secret management. We've shown you how we implement our components, but we also want to do that in a secure manner um, without having to pass around secrets or connection strings all over the place, uh, which might increase risk. So we're going to show you how we uh, implemented that in our environment, uh, and hopefully yeah, it'll help you to do the, the same thing. First of all, we use Azure Managed Identities, uh, which is a resource in Azure that manages, well, your identity. Um, you can provide it with a few roles for uh, certain resources in Azure, um, and then you can couple that to either um, other resources in Azure, or for example, using Azure Workload Identity, you can then couple that to pods or re uh, services inside of your cluster. Um, by doing this, you also enable Dapper to use those managed identities. It will, um, yeah, it can out of the box pick up that it has a managed identity available on the service that it's running on, um, and then it will use that to authenticate the services unless you specify a different method, for example, a connection string. So to show how that works, um, first of all, I'm going to show you the roles that I assigned to my managed identity. Here I have a uh, service bus topic uh, and a few queues that I um, yeah, authenticated it to, as well as um, event grid uh, and app configuration. Uh, then next up, I created an access policy on my key vault um, to say that it can get and list all the secrets from the key vault using um, well the application ID and object ID of the managed identity that I'm going to use in my service which is the same one that I showed before with the roles. Um, then I can specify a component in Dapper, where I say, okay, I want a secret store, uh, and it has to be of type key vault. Um, and then um, I can specify the name of my key vault. By doing this, because I already assigned an access policy to it, uh, Dapper can immediately pick up, hey, I have this managed identity available. I have the access policy that I need. So now I'm going to retrieve those um, uh, secrets from there, and I'll make them available to all other applications uh, if they want to use them. So to show an example of this, or sorry, of all the other components that might you want to use them. Uh, so to show an example of this, I, um, I'm going back to the state store uh, that I showed before. Um, here we have at the bottom um, yeah, a section about authentication where we can specify a secret store, and that's the same name that I specify for my secret store over here. So in this case, that will be Azure Key Vault. Um, and from there on, I can just, uh, for any secrets that I need, so for example, here for the password for Redis, I can, I can say instead of a normal string, uh, I provide a secret key reference, uh, which is going to be the name of my secret key in uh, the Key Vault. So in this case, the Redis password. So that enables me to, without uh, having to know the actual secret, still use secrets to uh, authenticate to certain resources. Um, you might also want to use those secrets uh, 
inside of your application code. Uh, you can also quite easily do that um, by running the following code. So uh, this example in our .NET code, we just uh, add the Dapper client uh, using the SDK. And then to configuration, we can call an extension method at Dapper secret store with the name of the secret store. So in this case, Azure Key Vault, uh, and then uh, also an instance of the Dapper client building. And this will enable um, our application everywhere to use those secrets. Do be aware that uh, on startup, you might have some issues using these secrets, um, because if you retrieve secrets from uh, Key Vault before the sidecar is available to serve them, um, you might run into an issue where neither your help, uh, sidecar or your application is healthy, uh, and that can cause your applications to crash. So be aware of that. OK, so that was a lot of information. Let's recap. Um, at the start of this presentation, uh, we saw the old situation at Iron with a lot of complexity and very little manageability, um, after which we uh, implemented Debra, um, where especially for us as developers, the key takeaways were that uh, um, we saw that for new developers, uh, it was quite a lot easier to get started uh, on projects at Archifrum. Um, reason for that being that we only have one um, framework that developers have to learn, which is Dapper, to integrate with almost any service, uh, external service that we have. Um, and secondly, um, Dapper also allows us to be very agile in our choice of technology. Um, if at any point we would like to uh, change any of the underlying infrastructure infrastructure technologies, uh, we can really easily do so uh, with Dapper with almost no changes to the code base. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them right now. We're happy to answer. Um, and if you think of anything later, please contact us at either our email addresses or on LinkedIn. Thank you.